Newcastle United deservedly beat Arsenal by one goal to nil at St. James's Park. Mikel Arteta thinks that Arsenal had to come down to our level. I think Newcastle were just better than them. I'm joined by Sai, Charlotte and Norman today in this podcast to talk about how Newcastle United have done it and what it means for the rest of the season. Sai, I'll start with you, mate. I want you to give me your feelings on the importance of that result because we've been doing podcasts all season, as we'll do. Uh, and it's not been great, has it? Performance, results haven't married up. We were five without a win in the Premier League, but we've gone. We've beaten Arsenal in the title race 1-0. What did it mean to you? It's massive. Absolutely massive. Um, really, really buzzing with it. Buzzing with the week, obviously, Chelsea on Wednesday as well. But um, it's it can be a turning point in the season. And I know we might get into the kind of the context of, of one win and it's not all sorted, but it was so big and everything seemed to click back into place in this one, which is the, the most important thing for me. It wasn't just a kind of a, a one-off good performance against Arsenal again. This just felt like the team was absolutely clicking again. So for me, it's huge. And it feels like that um, October, November surge that I've been talking about for the last four or five weeks and getting really worried about where it's going to come from. It started. I really feel like the, the, the team's coming together. It wasn't just having everyone back. It was having everyone back and playing properly and fit and and doing all their jobs. And, and I really feel like we outworked and out. Uh, we're just more motivated than Arsenal and that, that I hadn't been able to say that in many games this season where we wanted it more. We definitely wanted it more there. So for me, that's the most pleasing thing. There seems to be a desire there again. There seems to be an absolute drive and some focus. And yeah, I'm absolutely buzzing with with the result. I think the importance of, of scoring goals and Alexander Rysak as well, scoring goals is, is, is not to be underestimated. Once that starts, I think to your point about kind of everything falling into place and everything going really well for us, I think that that is a massive part of it. I think he's he looked more confident. He's able to roam a little bit more around the pitch. He's getting service because the midfield's working. Um, and each iteration of the midfield is working as well, which is also really um, mm. uh, buoying to see. But the importance of um, goal scoring, because pr- prior to this, even when he was on the pitch, we were wondering where goals were going to come from because we just weren't able to convert any of our chances. It was getting really, really frustrating. But I think it's a very psychological thing for him. Once you start, you just don't well I hope you just don't stop and I, but I, I do believe that that's gonna um play a massive part in the rest of our season so massively important I don't know if that first 11 has started together this season or if they have then they've started in those positions but to me that was a performance of a team yesterday who looked like they've been playing together all season which is fantastic given that it's the first time together and also this season we have looked disjointed we have looked a little bit like we haven't necessarily known what that particular identity is. However, yesterday it looked like a Newcastle United team that had been playing together for ages. Mm-hmm. And just quickly in terms of how I felt during the match before we get into the, the sort of nuts and bolts of the performance. Before the match, you know, if you have a massive drink like the night before and the next day you wake up and your whole world comes crashing around you <laughs> and you feel guilty about things that you haven't even done. That's how I felt walking to the match. <laughs> but then you're like, on those days, those hangovers, you think, if I just get a pint in, it might, it might help us. In the first 10 minutes, felt like having that first pint. I was like, you know what? I didn't feel too bad. By the end of the match, it was like I was on my fourth paint after the night before when you feel like shit. And you're like, you know what, the world's all right again. And that's exactly what it felt like. A massive hangover followed by a brilliant day in the pub. It was uh, it was beautiful. That's the analogy. A week's a long time in football, so it seems, because we sat in this very office last Sunday after that performance or non-performance at Chelsea. And then in the, the four days that followed before the Chelsea home fixture, so much conversation about the manager, about the direction of the club, about previous transfer windows, in the you know the the Chelsea home game obviously plays into this, but that Premier League performance against a, a much better side than Chelsea on paper anyway in terms of the league table and recent finishes really does like Sai says it just it just settles everything down settles everyone down. We are good. How has found a team that he likes this time last week? He didn't have that. It's, I mean, we we're going to get into how later in the team selection all that kind of stuff, but I just feel like this can provide everyone a bit of confidence regardless of what happens in the next game because the next game is really important don't get don't get me wrong need to go to forest and get a result but before that it's kind of been we've been going game to game week to week okay you go and get a positive result team selection still not right he's making changes at half time he's making three changes on 65 that kind of thing players in players out who's down the left who's you know all of that seems to have been settled in a kind of glorious four-day period Uh, and you know lots of people might might have said this all coming, but I don't think, I think a lot of people had concerns that Howe himself didn't particularly understand the direction he wanted his first team to go. What we saw yesterday, as Norman says, is a team that after 10 minutes, even before Newcastle scored, even though Arsenal probably had the shade of the opening part of the game, very much a, an expectation from me anyway that we could, we could win that game. Arsenal didn't have anything that was terrifying. Howe picked the right team and we got a massive result. And I just feel like the season 
feels alive, League Cup quarter final against a favourable opponent. Only three points behind Arsenal now in the league. And I think regardless of kind of Arsenal stuff, and we'll talk about a little bit of Arsenal stuff later, hopefully, but if you'd have said you'll go into early November three points behind Arsenal, that would have been acceptable. So a massive, massive result uh, and a great performance. And we're going to get into it on this podcast and I can't wait. So I want to get all of you, before we talk about the team and what happened in the game or specifics, I want to get kind of moments or individual highlights for you from this one because it is special beating Arsenal. Uh, I did a, a podcast for another football club previewing this one. I said it's a, the, the game of the season I kind of look forward to the least um, because of all the nonsense that goes on around it, the social media, the Arsenal statements. Um, but when you win, and when you win as comfortably as we did yesterday, I think you just really got to savour them and enjoy them. So, Charlotte, I'll start with you. What was your individual highlight of that victory? <clears throat> Well, I think there are obvious ones, and I know, um, spoiler, I know what other people are going to pick, or I know what you're going to pick. So I'm going to go with um, sort of just watching Saka start to limp through <laughs> throughout the... So he's right in front of where I was in the second half, and he just kept limping. He kept, he kept like, cr- uh, crouching down and, and bending over, and I was like, God, is he injured? Is he, is he very... Is he, he looks very sore. And the guy next to me was like, no, he limps when he's having a shite game. <laughs> and I was like, oh, does he? Is that a thing? And then it, it, it is... Sorry, it is... Um, you, like... He, apparently, there's, like, memes about it. Whenever he's having a terrible game, he starts to limp. And he really... It was, it was a pronounced limp yesterday because he was having a terrible time and I, and I really enjoyed watching it as soon as the ball came to his feet he was absolutely fine and then he'd get rid of it and he'd limp again and I just I really liked that moment and it was just like he could see that this wasn't going well it's in the second half you know there was moment in the sec- there were moments in the second half where they looked slightly more dangerous than they had certainly in the first half um, but every they couldn't they couldn't convert anything so um and then he just limped. And I really like that. So, so for me, it's just sort of typifies. You can see it. Everything's going wrong. I'm just going to limp for a bit. I love the idea that Lewis Hall's pocket just makes you limp. When, you, when you're <laughs> that far stuck in it, you can't walk properly. That's, that's, that's all it was, clearly. Give us your moment then, Si. Um, I, I mean, I'm going to talk about Sean Long stuff a lot on this podcast, as is my right. But um, <laughs> I, in terms of an actual moment of the game, I haven't just watched Match of the Day back this morning. Um, it's, it's the roar from Joe Linton uh, as the full-time whistle goes. I mean, it was a brilliant moment when they put their kind of last cross into the box and Nick Pope claims it and just lies down for about 20 seconds with the ball. That was lovely. And then the, it's, it's well after the five minutes added, by the way, and, and the crowd's going mental. Uh, and then the final whistle finally blows and Joe Linton just lets out this massive animal roar. And it's like, again, I don't feel like I've seen that much this season, that real desire, that real kind of how important this feels to the players. And it was nice to have that back, like players actually caring and really thinking we've done we've done the job here. So yeah, that, that moment of Joe Linton just screaming at 50,000 fans was, was a beautiful one. The Lewis Hall block from the Declan Rice corner mm. and that was whipped in. Arsenal are fantastic from set pieces, by the way. They've got a lot of goals this season and they're, they're a real danger. Uh, Saliba, Gabriel, superb in the box. They the really overload the six-yard box. I love it. There's something really old school about it. Like, let's just put the ball in the six-yard box with loads of players in there. And what did we do? We put a load of players in there as well. And everyone threw their bodies in the way. And it was very much like the 21-22 season where bodies were on the line. And Hall's block was superb. I mean, at that distance, sort of between the ball leaving the player's foot, in whole blocking it, he could easily have kind of, it could easily have smashed off his hand, he could have had his arms out, but he controlled his body and it came off him and it was absolutely perfect. And just quickly on the Joe Linton row, time back to 21 22. Yesterday's victory, it felt like a, a game where the players set out to prove something, like they did for most mm. of the 21 22 season. And Joe Linton's reaction at the end, it was very much like, look, we are good. We're not as shite as what people say we are. That's what it felt like. It did feel like we we're kind of going back to that era. So it was, it was brilliant to see. Mm. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. And I was getting nostalgic for the second half of the 21-22 season for a bit there. Mine uh, has to be Anthony Gordon's cross. Now, it's an obvious thing to pick the goal, but I'm not picking the goal. We'll talk about the goal later. But the, it, it, first of all, world-class cross. Uh, good pass from Sean Longstaff, decisive, quick. Quick ball, what Newcastle are bad at a lot. And what, you know, if, if we're going to be hypercritical of, say, the Brighton and Everton and, and, and those games against worse teams, move the ball too slowly, plays on too many touches. Mm-hmm. And particularly without Tonali, who's the best at moving the ball quickly, wasn't in the team. It was really important that Longstaff in particular did that yesterday. And I think that there's a clear directive from the manager to him saying, move the ball quickly when you've got it. So the the ball is quick to the extent that Arsenal aren't able to get close enough to Gordon. And also the back four for Arsenal isn't able to set itself and have a look where Isak is or move across because the ball has moved so quickly in the space of three seconds into the back of the net. But it just, that cross from Gordon just settles it. It settles it. Gordon plays on the right. 
He cannot make that. That goal does not happen unless that player, maybe Harvey Barnes, you could argue, but that player plays in that position. And even if we do argue Harvey Barnes, Howe has also been extremely reticent to bring Harvey Barnes onto that side of the pitch, even though he brings him on to good effect later in the game. It's settled. We've got a left side. That's crucial. We've now got a right side. No Murphy, no Almiron. If Anthony Gordon's fit for me, he plays in the right because mm-hmm. he can do that. And if he doesn't do that, we might not win the game. Uh, Miguel Almiron has to cut back. Um, Jacob Murphy can't cross, certainly not that well. Um, so players in that position with the right foot comp- of, of that quality uh, have to be of Anthony Gordon's level for us to score that goal and Arsenal couldn't cope with it and Arsenal couldn't deal with it. And I just think we've talked a lot on this podcast and I'm sure people listening and watching have done the same uh, probably since the end of the 22-23 season. What, who plays right for Newcastle? It's Anthony Gordon. He plays right because he can do that and he needs to stay in the team on that side. So I'm really, really happy because not only is that a brilliant moment in this game, it should just settle things moving forward. Uh, provided, of course, Julian stays fit and can can play down that left hand side, that left wing. So, absolutely brilliant, buzzing with that. How did you see it, Norman? And, and your kind of thoughts post game now? Now you saw the evidence of what Howe did. Where are you with kind of Howe's team and his team selections, and in particular the game yesterday? Post game probably just reinforced the fact that Eddie Howe was a better Premier League manager than me. I know I've not the chance, obviously, <laughs> to be proven as a Premier League manager, but I'm going to say he probably is in general better. Uh, but I obviously pre game, given how the back four looked against Chelsea with Kelly starting as a left sided centre half on Wednesday, I really wanted Kelly to start that game. I also was a little disappointed to see Longstaff start the game. I think I mentioned that in the Match Day podcast because Longstaff this season has been very poor. But yesterday, how we set up was very much our thoughts along the lines of that 21-22 season with a lower block, stifling the opposition, limiting their chances. I mean, I think Pope maybe made one save if that I can yeah, recall, can't, possibly. Can't any, yeah. even, even, if, even if that, that, was, that performance was very much like that season where we just absolutely dis- through, through pure discipline and through shithousery and moments of magic, little flashes of playing when we needed to play, being quick on the break, Joe Willick, very important to that as we're going to talk about later on. That's what it took me back to. And it's interesting you said something to me post-match yesterday, Alex, about the fact that we've, we seem to have found a solution for the left-hand side of the pitch. That is basically two-thirds of what the left-hand side of the pitch was in that 21-22 season, right? Willick and, and Joe Linton, basically they were, they were absolutely superb together. And I... I want to see us move forward playing like this. I think this system that we played yesterday is the best system for Newcastle United. And until we bring in perhaps personnel who can allow it to have that intensity as our identity, uh, you know, way of playing again, that would require a, you know, a centre half in the world of Mark Way. It would require perhaps Tenali and Guimaraes to play together. I think there's a question I would like to put to you a lot is can Guimaraes and Tenali play together while we play this particular system of football? Who knows? Because I thought Longstaff was sensational yesterday. So I am um, just just great in your, in your comments on Gordon are absolutely spot on. Um, irrespective of whether Gordon prefers to play on the left, how I suppose hopefully he's going to put his foot down and say, "Well, we're in this position with the players that we've got." You are on that right hand side because it was it was brilliant yesterday. I think that's the thing. Um, so much of uh, so much of the criticism that gets levied at how is about loyalty and this sort of loyalty to players and. Um, and the team selection yesterday, you sort of, you do look at that and you think, oh, Longstaff, okay. And uh, and being re- really like, that was that was sort of my, a no Tenali, although he did kind of signal that Tenali wasn't going to, in the press conference the, mm-hmm. the day before, we kind of said, well, Tenali's played three games in six uh, six days or so. Um, so we'll see, which is as, is as much of a giveaway as Eddie Howe's ever going to give. Um, and, and you sort of think about that, but actually those players uh, that, he got it right. It was right yesterday. It, those were the right players. Dan Byrne is a big physical presence, and and against you know Havertz, who is also tall, like he can. We talked about this. He he can he can deal with it. It, it, it. Lloyd Kelly was great midweek, but he also did get some game time a little bit later on, and it was just, they were all just the right calls, and they were the right like bent. It was the right bench and the right substitution calls as well, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but I think that's the thing we just kind of it it, it does it goes back to exactly what Norman's saying is like Eddie Howe might be a better Premier League manager than than, than most of us and <laughs> uh, not not you Alec don't worry I'm not I'm not talking about you um, but uh, yeah the calls were right yesterday 
and for all that we might want to point and say loyalty well the loyalty kind of paid off um Sean Longstaff is a kind of player that just he gets what Howe is asking of him and you you've just said it he, he he obviously knew that the directive was move that ball forward as as quickly as you can and he did it yesterday so you can't really fault that <laughs> To, to talk up Longstaff a bit more, um, the shape he gives us and the, the understanding of his role and actually the statistics speak for themselves. I think six of the last seven games that Longstaff started, we've won. Um, he gives us something and and um, it's balance. And I think, I don't know, it was Michael Richards or someone talked about it on Match of the Day, like balance in that team is something we've lacked. We've been a bit top heavy on one side. We've been a bit all over the place. Whereas every part of the pitch yesterday, I would really struggle to pick a man in the match because I think everything was was spot on and all 11 players did their jobs perfectly. So there's no higher praise than that, that the whole team is worthy of, of, of a man of the match consideration. It was Hall's man of the match, but well. um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on, uh, well, we'll talk about Hall later, but I think I think the thing for yesterday, he's picked a team for the fixture. And I think we can yeah. all see that now. Yesterday it did feel a bit like, because, because Tenali put in his best performance, there was a real desire to see if he could back it up mm. If, you know, when Bruno came on, to answer your question from earlier, Norman, when Bruno comes on on Wednesday, him and Tonali did link up really well, albeit for a limited amount of time. And I was really keen to see Tonali six, Bruno further forward. And how got it right? He didn't do that because he picked a, a side for the opposition. This is a massive result. It's been a massive week for how we talked on the podcast last week. And I think I said it, it felt like a bit of a low point or the low point of how's reign so far in terms of how many people were questioning him. Um, what the future looked like, a tough week ahead, two, two tough games, which we've won both, haven't conceded a goal, which is fantastic. But we're not fixed. You know, we're not, everything isn't sorted. I think we proved yesterday we're a good side. Mm. I think we can play teams like Arsenal at home uh, and and win fairly comfortably, like we've talked about. It wasn't, wasn't a, 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 you know, smash and grab win. I think we deserved the win on the mm. balance of play across the game. Mm. But it doesn't really instruct what will happen against Forest away or particularly West Ham and bad teams at home. And I think what, what I would like to see from Eddie Howe now is more of the same. It's picking the team that suits the opposition when, of course, you've got all the players available. If you don't have the players available, then you can't do that. But I think yesterday we didn't create lots. We didn't have to break down a, a really stubborn side who were playing counter-attack against us. That will come. That's, I assume, how West Ham will play when they come. So when West Ham comes to St. James's, it might be that Tonali plays and Longstaff doesn't and Bruno's further forward. So I think that's a real key thing moving forward. How pick the team he needed to pick on Wednesday and it was great. And then he picked the team he needed to pick yesterday and it was great. Yeah, I think, you know, midweek, one of the things that we got excited about was the fact that he was tinkering in game and responding to what was happening in game, which is something that we hadn't really seen that flexibility from him um, we hadn't really been seeing and you could see it yesterday as well I mean Joe Willock had to come off he was knackered but you know, t t he has the ability and the personnel and yes we all wish we'd strengthen more in the last two windows so that we had even more options and things like that but his tinkering it's not like for like it's it's okay we're one nil up I'm going to bring Bruno off and I'm going to put, put Kelly on and and just kind of shore that up a little bit and and there's tired legs at the back line and that, and that I'm just going to add a little bit there and and all of those sort of like little tinkery bits that we just haven't seen he is starting to do and I, and I and I believe that that's just going to kind of grow or I hope that that's going to just grow and we're not just going to revert back to it's 65 minutes so we're making these substitutions now if that's what's working now how has to be okay with that and be ruthless enough to say look no this is a starting lineup and you might you're going to feature later in the game he needs to rotate the team better he needs to, to mix it up a bit and we've seen that over the last four days so yeah long may that continue but yeah big test of whether we can continue that into the next few fixtures let's talk about performances now big performances all over the pitch and so i'll come back to you then on, on sean longstaff uh, because it was a big game for longstaff big week and uh he's found himself back in the team uh, for both fixtures played really well in both what do you want to say mate I mean yeah you've referenced his, his forward passing which is a nice new feature to his game <laughs> um, which we haven't seen much of and uh, yeah I, I suppose again Sean Longstaff suited the fixture I was not having the ball much and him having to just do the the absolute simple stuff really well which he did um, you know he's a player that frustrates the crowd and us uh, a lot of the time when it's one of those teams that do play a low block and we need to move the ball quickly and get into break breakthrough lines of 10 players He's probably not the right player for those, but he's, he's the right player for Arsenal at home because, one, positionally, 
I don't think there's anyone better in the team positionally. He closes all the gaps, he runs, he covers loads of ground. And actually, every time Arsenal came at us with the ball, whether it was uh, Marino or, or Rice, there wasn't any gaps to pass into. He was in the way, he was blocking stuff, but he was also closing all that space and doing everything he could to cover Livermento at fullback and, and all that stuff. Um, I would also say that for, for Anthony Gordon to be able to cross the ball as well as he did first time relies on that initial pass to be perfect, perfectly weighted and in the perfect place from just ping it in first time. Lots of credit to um, Sean Longstaff for the pre-assist there. But yeah, um, I mean, what some Longstaff's performance up for me is that he got his name sang by the crowd, which I mean, I, I, I thought I'd never hear that again because <laughs> of how the season's been, how the last 12 months has been going for, for Sean Longstaff. He's had, he's had a rough old time. It was really nice to see him play with a bit of confidence, get the crowd behind him again. And I think his teammates seem to really appreciate his, his input as well. So yeah, it wasn't just Longstaff playing well for him. You know, we, we, we talked about this as well, normal. He, he's been a three out of 10 quite a few times a season and that was him playing a six out of 10. No, that was an eight out of 10 genuine, really good performance from him. And yeah, he's deserving as, of as much praise as anyone else on the pitch from yesterday. Let's talk about Joe Willock, Norman. I always like talking about Joe Willock. I think what he gives Newcastle when he's fully fit is a dimension that no other player can give and it's his ability to to get, in, get into channels, run in between players. He can carry the ball He's always a goal threat. I think if you get a full season out with Joe Willock, you should be looking at double figures from him, really. Even yesterday, he probably had what two best chances, other than the goal. Uh, you think of the shot that Raya saved low down. That was a, a beautiful one, too. He played with Anthony Gordon, by the way. And uh, obviously, later on, he had, a, he had a shot that he tried to claim a corner for, which was like about 20 foot over the bar, knowing yeah, Raya's hands. But still, <laughs> the fact is that he is the type of player who gets into those positions. And I think Willock being in the team... So if you think of Willock being out of the team, and you think of the fact that Longstaff was presented on numerous occasions with good chances to score and his finishing isn't isn't the best. Will it be in the team? It's almost like it takes that away from Longstaff and then Longstaff's able to go back to what he does best. Will it becomes the sort of midfield goal threat or at least a player who gets himself into positions where other players have got a chance to, to score perhaps. Mm. He, you know, he, he pulls defenders. His graft levels are incredible. And I think a midfield with Joe Willock in is better than a midfield without, simple as that. And you look at the comments that Lewis Hall made after the match yesterday... Now, one of the issues with Hall early on in his Newcastle career was, okay, he's fantastic going forward. He needs to work on the defensive side of his game. Obviously, that's happened. But Hall himself said yesterday, having Big Joe ahead of him, sorry, Big Joe at the head, right ahead of him, and then sort of medium-sized Joe, Joe Willock, um, <laughs> in, in, in front of him, um, he said the graft that they put in was unbelievable. And, and it's absolutely right, that, that left-hand side of the pitch with, with Joe Willock and Joe Linton allows Hall to, his game levels just rise. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's Hall has had numerous players in front of him this season and that's always going to impact on a young player in terms of what they, what they can do with those two players in front of him yesterday. He was, I mean, you said it, Alex, he was, he was man the match. A big part of Lewis Hall being man the match yesterday was having Joe Willock and Joe Linton in front of him. So I, I, don't think Ian, I don't think I can stress his importance anymore that season that we qualified for the Champions League. Willock was a vital cog in that particular team. So they like to see him back. And uh, right now, talking about rotation, of course, he might need rotated if we play three games in a week. And he's tired. He's had a couple of long-term injuries. But ultimately, I think Joe Willock needs to be a guaranteed spot on that side. I agree. I think that you were getting into the realms of what can't he do with Lewis Hall. Um, he's good in the air. He's really competitive in the air. Great leaf on him. Good header of the ball. He's quick. Uh, he's he can tackle. He's excellent at retaining the ball, keeping possession, finding a black and white shirt. He's up and down the line. He he looks fit. He looks like he can last ninety minutes now. Uh, and to be so young and have all of those qualities is incredibly exciting for him. And it's not been easy as Newcastle career. You know, he's come in although it was a loan with an obligation to buy. He's still come in as a thirty-five million pound, eighteen-year-old left back. A lot of pressure. Newcastle fan, family links to the region. A lot of pressure on his young shoulders. And it didn't go well from last season. He had a bad season last season. The team didn't have a great season last season. So he's come into a struggling team uh, compared to what he'd signed for. Uh, and then he can't shift Dan Byrne from left back. And Dan Byrne was not a particularly popular left back as well with Newcastle fans. And he couldn't shift him. And I think there's possibly a reality where this season, if Sven Botman starts the season, Hall starts the season out of the team. But he's taken his opportunity. He's dropped a couple of times, probably a little bit unfairly. But... In terms of auditions to try and kind of see where Lewis Hall really is with his development, I think playing Arsenal captain Saka kind of off the pitch for most of the game is right up there with the biggest test you can face in this league and he's passed it with tremendous colours. Where are we then uh, with all of this? In fact, I'll, I'll start off by, by talking up the result again because 
Make no mistake, this was a crucial game for Arsenal. Now, subsequent events, uh, Manchester City's defeat at Bournemouth, play that down a little bit. We're going to talk about Mikel Arteta in a second, but really, the feeling I get is their fan base, for that fan base, have coped with it pretty well because there is just no conspiracy theory they can point at. There's no hard luck story. They just weren't good enough. And Eddie Howe outcoached Mikel Arteta, and we deserve to win the game. And I think that in itself is worthy of, of discussion because even going back to last season, every time Arsenal lost a game, it's, there's always something, some huge fallout online afterwards. It's been quiet online from Arsenal fans. Nothing to say from an Arsenal perspective. You weren't very good. You lost to a better side. It was a tight game, but you lost to a better side. You didn't create any chances. You didn't deserve to score. Let's move on. And I think that in itself is uh, worth celebrating because Newcastle have done a real job on, on Mick Art at the side. So well done to everybody there. Um, but what, how, how are you all feeling? Kind of, you know, we've, we've been up and down a little bit as Newcastle fans on this podcast and the fan base has in general. My view I've already given, I don't think everything is fixed. It's promising. It's really positive and promising. But we're going to need uh, a variety of team selection, I think, to kind of deal with different challenges. I'll just open the floor to anyone. Is anyone, are we fixed? Is, 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 the, is the season looking golden? Yeah, I feel a lot more confident. I, do you right? We're not fixed. I don't think you can say we're fixed after it's literally like at time of recording less than a week since that Chelsea game. So let's just remember that. Um, we're not fixed, but there is confidence. There is, I, I have a lot more confidence in the tactical flexibility that we've seen over the past six days um, in the in the competition that we've talked about, in particularly in the midfield, but sort of elsewhere on the pitch too. Um, Sven Botman was in the team picture yesterday. So he's obviously, you know, in and around the club in a, in a, in a more... Um, tangible way than he has been and, and potentially doing some light training so we've also got him to come back into our season so in those terms I am I am more confident I think Forest is a really really important game um it's uh it's going to be a really interesting one but I do feel a lot more confident um having seen how we've played midweek and then yesterday that um, that we can we can do this. I think the players are growing in confidence. Management's obviously growing in confidence, and and that's kind of the piece that was missing almost. Just that kind of arrogance, and I and I feel that now we're kind of just gonna kick on. As a fan, I mean, it's up and down, right? A win and everything's fantastic. A defeat, and I'm like, you know, I can't watch this anymore. I'm, <laughs> I, I need to leave. But it's it's the players. It's their self confidence that's important. And if you look at Alexander Isak's comments after the match yesterday, I like the fact that he used uh, it's a real icebreaker, which I think that might be a Swedish uh, sort of direct translation because it means something a bit different in English, I feel. But he, <laughs> what he was, we've, we've just smashed through, we've smashed through the Arctic ice and now we're flying towards the North Pole. But um, it, it, it's that it's that self-belief in the players, right? The way we played this season in five games time, if we're still playing like we did yesterday, if we've picked up 10 points, then yes, things appear to have been fixed. One result doesn't make a season. So I'm feeling really confident, but I'm very, very keen to see how these next two games go. And, and the rotation thing is really important. If Lloyd Kelly comes in against West Ham at home, I think that's a real positive step. If Dan Byrne comes in the team against Nottingham Forest away to, to play against the goal machine that is Chris Wood, again, I think that's a really, that'll be a really good decision. Uh, we've also already drawn at Forest this season, which in hindsight turns out to be a very good result. I actually beat them on penalties. Bournemouth away. We drew a Bournemouth away and they've lost, the, they've beaten... Arsenal and Man City so again in hindsight a good result we're in a good we are in a good place as you see Alex three points off of Arsenal four points off me Forest in uh, in third. third so I get through these next couple of games then we can start talking about things being fixed and really looking up the table there, there does possibly feel like a little bit of missed opportunity stuff when we look at previous performances and results you know particularly that Everton game they were really put aside and you know we should we should have won that one I think I think it's a little bit different to Manchester City. So you know, after the Manchester City uh, game, it was one-one, and everyone was really positive after that. And s same conversations about being fixed and about being able to move forwards, and it was a bit of a false dawn. But again, I think one of the, the crucial things about this week, I, I firmly believe that questions that remained unanswered have now been answered. Who's Newcastle's best left back? Lewis Hall, without a doubt. Who plays left midfield for Newcastle? Drew Willock. Who plays left wing? Is it Gordon? Is it Barnes? It's neither. It's Joe Linton. Who plays on the right? Okay, well, now even yesterday, um, Howe brings on Barnes uh, on the right-hand side to do a kind of defensive job. And he does really well, to be fair to him, mm. in, in, in the, in, to the extent that he can in the time he had. Mm. Um, 
they just seem like settled questions. There's a lot more settled questions. Where does Sandro Tonali play? When he plays okay, he plays at six. Comes on yesterday, plays at six. Bruno moves to the left-hand side of midfield. These are just things that weren't happening before. It's like there's a clarity there from this week. And there's a, there's, you know, we have to go to Forest. If you lose at Forest or you, do, you pick up one point from the next two, then those questions become much bigger again. But I feel for now, forget about us talking about this stuff. I think for Eddie Howe and the team, they have answers to questions that they've been searching for all season. I think on that note, we will leave it there. Thanks to the three of you for joining me for this. It's been a very entertaining conversation for me anyway. Hope, hope so for you as well, the listener, the viewer. See you all very soon. Bye-bye.